All right, this is Job 32 in the MacArthur Study Bible in the Endearing Word Commentary. All right, a little refresher. So, Job 31, Job gives his final speech to his three friends, and he pronounces curses upon himself if he actually did walk unrighteously. So he was still arguing that he was a righteous man, and if he wasn't, then yeah, he would deserve judgment. So that is what uh, he was saying in chapter 31, and pretty much that was the end of his speech. And it would seem like now God would finally respond after all of the men have said what they have said, but now there's going to be another guy who's going to respond, this guy named Elihu, in chapter 32, and I'll go ahead and start this chapter. All right, so the first section, why Elihu spoke. All right, in the first five verses, Elihu and his dissatisfaction with the answers of Job's friends. All right. So the three men, so these three men ceased answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. And then the wrath of Elihu, the son of Berisel the Buzite of the family of Ram, was aroused against Job. His wrath was aroused because he justified himself rather than God. Also against his three friends, his wrath was aroused because they found no answer and yet had condemned Job. Now because they were years older than he, Elihu had waited to speak to Job. When Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouth of these three men, his answer was, I'm mean, sorry, his wrath was aroused. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and read the summary here. This summary is actually from chapters 32 through 37, because through these chapters, Elihu is going to be the only one speaking. All right, so MacArthur says a new participant who has, who had been, been there with the others entered the debate over Job's condition, the younger Elihu, who took a new approach to the issue of Job's suffering. Angry with the other three, he had some new thoughts, but he was very hard on Job. Elihu was angry, full of self-importance, and verbios. Yeah, but his approach was refreshing after listening repetitiously to the others, though not really helpful to Job. Why was it necessary to record and read those four blistering speeches by this man because they happened as a part of the story while Job was still waiting for God to disclose himself. All right. And so Elihu's going to say what he's going to say in these coming chapters and then God is finally going to respond in chapter 38. All right. So we'll just hear Elihu in these next several videos, so get ready. All right, so that's what MacArthur had to say about these coming chapters. All right, and then uh, Endearing Word says, These three men ceased answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. So at the end of Job's persuasive arguments in chapters 28 through 30, his friends had nothing more to say, and they still thought that Job was completely wrong, but they felt he was so confirmed in his own opinions, being righteous in his own eyes, that it was useless to, just to keep the discussion going. Yeah, like, what's the use? We can't reason with this guy. Yep, we tried, but he just wouldn't listen. So what's the use? All right, and then Elihu begins to speak pretty soon. 
And this guy, Elihu, is the uh, son of Beresel, the Buzzite of the family of Ram. So MacArthur says that Buzzite, yeah, yeah, Elihu's ancestry was traced to the uh, Arabian tribe of Buzz, which is actually mentioned in Jeremiah 25, verse 23, listed among various nations that God was going to judge in that chapter. But the family of Ram is unknown, so but that's just yeah, where he's from. And then, uh, and then Endearing Word says that this is the first mention of Elihu in the book of Job because he appears, dominates all discussion, and then just abruptly leaves. And some modern commentators think that he, would, that he wasn't really a part of the story and was just inserted into the account later by the author or another editor. Yeah, I don't know, probably not, but some think that. Of all the friends of Job, Elihu was the only one with the genealogy. And Trapp says, The Buzzite he is called either from his progenitor Buzz, the son of Naor, who was the brother of Abraham, and had by, yeah, Milcah, yeah, Huz, the firstborn of, yeah, of whom some think Job came, and Buzz, his brother. Yeah, Genesis 22, 21, or else from his country, the city of Buzz, a city of Idomea, yeah, Jeremiah 25, 23. So just a little bit more of ancestry. Let me see what that verse in Genesis says real quick. Genesis twenty-two twenty-one, 21 in the chapter where Abraham almost sacrifices Isaac but then the Lord stops it so the family of Naor I'll go ahead and read some of this now it came to pass after these things that it was told to Abraham saying indeed Milcah has borne children to your brother Nahor Huz his firstborn and Buzz his brother so there you go so just descendants of Abraham and so so yeah so uh, so Elihu would be a descendant of Buzz maybe and then uh, I think I just read there that probably you know, Job yeah may have been from Huz all right so anyway all right and the uh, Mention of his genealogy is important because it reminds us that Elihu was not a fictional character. Yeah, his pedigree is that is his pedigree is this particularly described partly for his honor and yeah, principally to evidence the truth of this history, which is other which otherwise might seem to be but a poetical fiction. So I guess putting the genealogy in here would, I guess, show that this is just not merely fiction. This is like historical evidence. And that this Elihu was really a real person. Yeah. Yeah, that's what Poole said. All right, and then Elihu, he is called, the name is Hebrew, my God is he. That's what Bradley says. And then Smick says... Elihu appears and disappears suddenly, yet he does belong and his speech makes sense here. It is true that Elihu is not mentioned elsewhere in the book, so his speeches could be left out. But at the beginning of chapter 32 and at the end of 37, they are skillfully woven into the fabric of the book and made to play a legitimate role. And then Clark says, but the question has been asked, but still the question has been asked, yeah, who was Elihu? I answer, he was the son of Beresel the Buzzite of the kindred of Ram. That's all we know of him. But 
this scriptural answer will not satisfy those who are determined to find out mysteries where there are none. And some make him out to be a descendant of Judah, Jerome, uh, Bide, Lyranus, and some of the rabbis make him Balaam, the son of Beor, the magician, yeah, and Bishop of Warburton make him Ezra the scribe, Dr. Hodges makes him the second person in the glorious trinity, yeah, how does that work? Or the Lord Jesus Christ, and supposes that the chief, the chief scope of this part of the book was to convict Job of self-righteousness, and to show the necessity of the doctrine of justification by faith. When these points are proved, they should be credited. That's what Clark says. Yeah, I don't know about all of that of some people identifying a lie who was this person or this person. And some of those names I don't even know. So, all right, but that's a little bit about who this Elihu guy is, some of his background. Okay, and then it says that he got pretty mad with Job. Yep, his the wrath of Elihu was aroused against Job because he justified himself rather than God. But he's also mad at the three friends because they had found no answer and yet had condemned Job. All right, so Endearing Word goes on and says, Apparently, Elihu was a silent listener at the whole, uh, at the whole dialogue up to this point, and he was angry against Job because he felt that Job justified himself rather than God. And Elihu felt that Job was more concerned about being right himself than God being right. Now, we can understand how Elihu felt this, yet what he did not understand was that both Job and God were right. Yeah, the friends had forced themselves and Job into a false dilemma. Either Job is right or God is right. They could not see and understand how both were right. Yeah, Job is right in saying that he's righteous before God, and God says that he's righteous before God, so there you go. But of course, you know, the friends couldn't see that, and Elihu doesn't see this either. He just thinks that Job is just trying to justify himself and that he's just being self righteous or whatever. Yep, and the friends, I guess, just didn't do a good enough job in really trying to, you know, get Job to come to his senses. And they just, I guess, backed off, and they just didn't do great, so I guess, you know, not very happy with them either. Yep. And they pretty much just kept repeating the same things over and over again. Yep. All right, and then Smick says, four times in the Hebrew text, we are told that he was angry. First at Job for justifying himself rather than God, and then at his friends because of their inability to refute Job. Yeah, that's what Smick says. And Morgan says, Elihu will speak, but Job will not answer him. Job never had the opportunity to answer him. God took no notice of him except to interrupt him. Yeah, because after Elihu finishes in chapter 37, yeah, God's going to speak in 38. All right. And Elihu was angry at Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar because they failed to solve the controversy. Yeah, they found no answer. While at the same time, they were, in Elihu's opinion, too harsh against Job and had yet condemned Job. So, not happy that they couldn't find an answer in dealing with Job's problem or whatever, and really no way to ultimately refute what Job was saying. And I guess they were pretty harsh as well. Yeah, they definitely were, especially Eliphaz in chapter 22 with false with those false accusations. It was terrible. All right, and Elihu was angry with everybody. He is the classic angry young man 
And from the outset, what we need to notice about this kind of anger is that it puts him in a class by himself. And the fact that he's angry at both sides of the debate separates him from Job. And on the one hand, on the one hand, but it also separates him from the other three friends, according to Mason. So Elihu's in his own camp. So he doesn't really agree with either side. He has issues with both sides. Yep. Yeah, because they were years older than he, Elihu waited to speak to Job. So out of respect for those older than he, Elihu held back for as long as he felt he could. Now he felt like that he simply had to speak. Clark said, How young he was or how old they were, we could not tell, but there is no doubt but there was no doubt a great disparity in their ages. Yep, so yeah, Elihu is definitely the youngest out of all these guys. I don't know how young he really is, so maybe in his 30s or 40s, I don't know. Alright, and then finally he, uh, in verses 6 through uh, 9, uh, Elihu says why he overcame his hesitancy to speak. All right, six through nine. So Elihu, the son of Bereshel, the Buzite, answered and said, I am young in years, and you are very old. Therefore I was afraid, and dared not declare my opinion to you. I said, Age should speak, and multitude of years should teach wisdom. But there is a spirit in man, and the breath of the Almighty gives him understanding. Great men are not always wise, nor do the aged always understand justice. All right. So, uh, so he says, I'm young in years, you're very old, therefore I was afraid and dared not declare my opinion to you. And MacArthur says that he may have called it opinion, but he claimed it had come... Uh, by inspiration from God. Yep, and in chapter 33, verse 6, he's going to say, Truly I am as your spokesperson before God. Yeah, so which is it? Opinion or from God? So, anyway. Well, ultimately the Lord was behind these words, so whether Elihu realized it or not, these words ultimately were put down in here as God's word, so, yeah. All right. So, uh, Elihu, going back to endearing word, Elihu came as a young man among older men, and because of this was willing to hold his words for a long time. Yeah, I'm, in, I'm young in years and you're very old. All right, and that's why he didn't speak yet. Yeah, he said, I was afraid and dared not to declare my opinion to you. I said, I said, age should speak and multitude of years should teach wisdom. Yep, but there is a spirit in man and the breath of the Almighty it gives him understanding. And great men are not always wise, nor do the aged, aged, always understand justice. All right, and the Deering Word says that Elihu believed that just because Job and his three friends were older, it did not mean that they were the only ones with a spirit of man, in a spirit in a man, and the only one who had received, and the only one who had received understanding from the Almighty. There is a spirit of man so Poole says, so the sense of this place is, every man as a man, whether old and young or young, hath a reasonable soul, by which he is able in some measure to discern between good and evil, and to judge, and to judge of men's opinions and discourses, and therefore I also may venture to deliver my own opinion. 
and Meyer says, We have been trying to know God by the intellect, by reading the Bible intellectually, by endeavoring to apprehend human systems. There is, however, a deeper and truer method. There is a spirit in man. Open your spirit to the divine spirit, Holy Spirit, as you open a window to the sunny air. And really, you can't understand the things of God, ultimately, if you don't have the spirit in you or the mind of Christ. Otherwise, you know, they're foolishness to you and they can't be discerned. That's 2 Corinthians 2. All right. So everybody has the ability to reason and to think and all that. Yeah, I mean, we do get that from God. Yeah. And so will I who's going to say what he thinks. But he also says in verse 9, Great men are not always wise, nor do the aged always understand justice. So endearing word again says, We can only imagine the reaction from, from Job and his three friends at the words of Elihu. They were probably united together for the first time in a long time. They may not agree with each other. Yeah, but they certainly all would agree that this young upstart could be wiser or have more understanding than they did yeah that pretty much Elihu was pretty much saying that you guys are not really very wise and Elihu believed that the older men for all their supposed wisdom didn't understand the matter at all he thought that the older men were wrong and that the young men in particular himself was, were right. The thinker and writer G.K. Chesterton wrote this about men like Elihu. I believe what really happens in history is this. The old man is always wrong and the young people are, are always wrong about what is wrong with him. And this, practi this practical form it takes is this, that while the old man may stand by some stupid custom, the young man always attacks it with some theory that turns out to be equally stupid. Yeah, basically, yeah, sometimes the old person may not be very wise in what they say or what they believe. And yeah, the young person doesn't like it, but yet they come up with something that's just as stupid and as foolish even as that other thing. <laughs> Nevertheless, we could say that in principle, Elihu was correct. Age is no just measure of wisdom. Yeah, and there's even young people that can be wise, obviously. And yeah, older people that are not wise. So there is truth in that. There are beardless sages and gray-headed children, you know, Trapp says. Yeah, you got young people that are wise and you got old people that are not. So, yeah, that is true, in principle. Yeah, but making himself out to be the wisest out of all the others, yeah, that looks pretty arrogant, I would say. All right, and then Elihu shows some of the strengths and weaknesses of his youth. Despite his anger and wordy lecturing style, Elihu never got bitter as did uh, Bildad and Zophar against Job. Yeah, that's what Smick says. Yeah, he is pretty wordy, so that's gonna come about in the rest of this chapter. Yeah, I'm kind of a wordy guy myself, too, so I can sort of relate. Alright, and then the second section, Elihu introduces his speech. So, 10 through 14, Elihu criticizes uh, Bil uh, Bildad, Eliphaz, and Zophar as ineffective. And there's actually no more notes from MacArthur for this chapter, so the rest of the notes are going to be an endearing word. Okay. So, that's interesting. Alright, so Elihu says, Therefore I say, listen to me, I will declare my opinion. It says opinion again. Indeed, I waited for your words. I 
listen to your reasonings while you searched out what to say. I paid close attention to you, and surely not one of you convinced Job or answered his word, uh, answered his words, lest you say we have found wisdom. God will vanquish him, not man. Now he has not directed his words against me, so I will not answer him with your words. Alright, so Endearing Word says, From this request for the intention and ear of Job, Eliphaz, and Bildad, and Zophar, we can assume that there were sour and disdainful faces on the older men. Yeah, especially when saying great men are not always wise. Yeah, but now he says, listen to me. Yep, and yet Elihu pressed forward asking for this audience. And pretty much this whole rest of the chapter, he's pretty much just going to keep saying, listen to what I'm going to be saying to you guys in just a very wordy way. All right. And Elihu was frustrated because Job's friends didn't put him in his place in the way he thought they should. And we can imagine Elihu following the debate, thinking of what he would say in response to Job, and being frustrated that the answers of Job's friends were not as brilliant as the answers in Elihu's mind. <laughs> yep, and he says, I'm not going to respond to Job with your words. All right, and then the final verses, 15 through 22. Elihu's inner compulsion to speak. They are dismayed and answered no more. Words escaped them, and I have waited because they did not speak, because they stood still and answered no more, the three friends. I will also answer my part. I too will declare my opinion, saying opinion again. For I am full of words, the spirit within me compels me. Indeed, my belly is like wine that has no vent. It is ready to burst like new wineskins. I will speak that I may find relief. I must open my lips and answer. Let me not, I pray, show partiality to anyone, nor let me flatter any man, for I do not know how to flatter, else my maker would soon take me away. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to speak. Just listen. Get on with it. Yes, get on with it. Get on with it. Yeah. Elihu noted that Job's friends were exhausted by the debate in the mind of Elihu. It was fortunate that he had so much energy and so many words because now he could start where the three friends had left off and spend this whole chapter saying how he's going to get started. Yeah, get on with it. Yeah, as it said, and as it says in that Monty Python quote. Get on with it! Alright, I am full of words. The spirit within me compels me. Yeah, Elihu certainly was full of words, and for this and the next five chapters, he will drone on and on, unable to shut up and unable to let anyone else speak. It is by far the largest, yeah, the longest sing, uh, single speech in the book of Job, longer than even God's speech in the later chapters. And we notice already that Elihu has spent a chapter simply introducing his speech. Yeah, a long introduction. He hasn't even gotten to the real points he wants to make. Such long introductions and wordy methods are characteristic of Elihu. And he was not the last man on earth to use many words. Well, probably with using a lot of words, it makes you sound probably more wise and more profound. Well, Elihu definitely thought he was much more wise than the friends, so, and that they were totally wrong in what they were saying, and now he's going to say what he wants to say, and thinks, and he's thinking that what he's going to say is going to be right. So, alright, and Schmick says... Almost all modern interpreters have found Elihu to be unsufferably wordy. Mackenzie says that this takes 
that it takes 25 uh, 20 sorry 24 verses well really 22 verses well I think really 16 because he actually starts speaking in cha uh, verse 6 but pretty much the majority of this whole chapter it takes him that time to say look out I'm going to speak yeah listen to me yeah and again Monty Python get on with it yes get on with it get on with it get on with it All right, let me not, I pray, show partiality to anyone, nor let me flatter any man. For I do not know how to flatter, else my maker would soon take me away. All right, so Elihu was determined to flatter no man except himself. Yeah, in this obviously self-flattering introduction to the speech, Elihu has clearly presented himself as smarter, wiser, and having more understanding than any of the four other men with him. Elihu seemed perfectly unaware of how he sounded and looked. Yeah, and as I said, coming across as arrogant, if you ask me. And that's actually the end of that chapter. Yep, so 32, listen to what I'm saying, and then 33, I'm finally going to say it. All right, so that's the end of that chapter, so I'll get to 33 and continue with Elihu. But until then, may God bless you and the grace and mercy won by Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.